Um, and my background is um, I, I love the West, the Western Washington. I grew up here and um, the, the Northwest is, is my home. And so I love the, the native plants and I love the plant diversity here. And I've learned that a lot of the plants that I'm seeing out there are actually non-native and invasive. And so I've spent a good number of years, um, we'll say over 20 at this point, working on um, teaching people about invasive plants and, and trying to control them. So that's the focus of tonight. And we're going to be focusing on plants that have impacts in forests, in woodland areas. Um, and I'll start off by uh, just talking a few terms. So I, I like to define what I mean by invasive plant. Invasive plant is an invader. It's, it's something that's been introduced here, a plant that's been introduced from a different part of the world. Um, but that's not enough to make it an invasive plant. It also has to uh, spread on its own, reproduce on its own, and then create a negative impact in the area that it escapes into. Um, so it takes a lot for a plant to get to that point where we call it invasive um, and that we really try to get rid of it. Um, I like to use English ivy as a good example. This is a plant that can really transform a forest um, from a diverse habitat into one, which is we call it an ivy desert. So um, that's kind of a good example of a true invasive plant. And then um, there are invasive plant impacts specific to forestry. So there are the, the forest health impacts. Um, the, the health of the forest could be defined by the health of the trees, the native plant diversity, the habitat value for wildlife, birds, fish, insects, um, things like the, the soil, the water quality. Um, when you have a lot of evergreen trees, you can have good cover in the winter. When you have weeds, a lot of them are deciduous or herbaceous, not woody, and they can you know, increase the erosion problems into streams. Um, and then there are economic costs. Uh, invasive plants in general all will reduce the, the growth of your trees, the timber value, slow down the forest regeneration, natural or planted, um, increase the cost of the forest management. Um, weed control costs a lot of money. Um, forestry is not a high profit <laughs> undertaking, so that can really eat into the um, resources that you have. Um, and then scotch broom is a good example of a plant that just has a huge economic impact on Washington and Oregon's um, forestry. Um, so this is a plant that um, is used, often used as an example of um, a plant can have a big impact. Um, so, uh, but I work for, you notice, the noxious weed program. And so this is a term that is used in Washington to define a legal um, group of plants. They are all non-native, just like the invasive plants, but they also have um, a wide range of impacts. So not just ecosystems or natural resources, they could also impact farming, agriculture, um, human health, property values, uh, wildlife. So there's a, a, a lot of different impacts that these plants have. Um, it's defined and regulated at the state level by the state noxious weed law and the state noxious weed board. Um, but it's the counties that carry out the law, that implement the law, and that teach people um, like yourselves about these noxious weeds. Um, so there's a great um, bounty of information on the Washington State uh, website, so I highly encourage you to take a look there and get lots of good information on noxious weeds. Um, just kind of in a nutshell, um, the way the, the weed list is categorized is by how widespread are these weeds? Do we have an opportunity to eradicate this particular weed, or are we at the stage where it's so widespread that we're just trying to do triage and just try to reduce it where we can? So the class A weeds are those ones where there's still a hope that we can actually eradicate it, we can eliminate it from Washington. Um, if we really work hard at it, if everybody works together. Um, the class B weeds are weeds that particular counties or regions still have a chance at reducing the spread, but perhaps in other areas it's too far gone. And then the class C weeds is really everything else. And a lot of the class C weeds are very widespread. So there's not gonna be any regulation or requirement for controlling them. Mostly it's about awareness, technical assistance, um, trying to work together. So something like English ivy again, if you work with your neighbors and trying to remove it, you're gonna be a lot more effective. 
uh, but some neighbors aren't going to go along with you, and so you're just going to continually have reinvasion um, of those plants. Whereas for the Class A weeds, um, the state requires control, and so you kind of have help in getting rid of those. Um, so this kind of summarizes the way I think of the, the noxious weed law. It contains and eradicates new weeds when first detected. That's the primary mission that we're trying to do. Just like in wildfire, you know, when that first little fire outbreak happens, you put everything you can into in putting it out because, you know, you're going to have a, a, a much better return on your investment. You're going to do a really good job of putting that fire out. But once it's a widespread problem, you're working on containment you know, draw a line in the sand and try to keep it from spreading further. And maybe try to reduce its impact in the area where it's already widespread. So this is kind of what we do um, at the state level. And you could think of it on your own property. You know, if you have an, a new outbreak of a really common weed, it's new to you. And so it makes sense to get out there and do that early detection rapid response. You know, whereas a weed that's widespread, you know, maybe you're just going to focus on containment at that point. All right, so really what we're looking at for noxious weed control um, statewide or locally is it starts with prevention, which means trying to not spread these weeds, and then early detection, rapid response. Watch for infestations of new weeds. Don't spread it around. Tell somebody. If you're in King County, you can use our app or our website, but if you're anywhere in Washington, you can use the app that the Washington Invasive Species Council has called WA Invasives or you can use the Washington State Noxious Weed website to find your county weed board and let them know because that's really helpful and then we can all work really hard on controlling it uh, before it takes over the world. All right, so that's the Noxious Weed Law and that's all I'm gonna talk about about that right now. Um, feel free to ask questions um, in the chat for later. But let's talk about managing invasive weeds in forests. Um, I'm gonna give you a few general tips um, things to think about in general for weed control that you can apply to any forest weed um, situation, and then we'll get into the actual um, specific weeds. So first of all, when you're controlling weeds in a forest, you're trying to protect your trees, the trees and the forest plants, because that's what you're trying to accomplish, right? So if you had it to start all over again before the trees are even there, um, controlling the weeds before you plant is really helpful. Now, if you have a new area that you're going to turn into forest, um, this is this is great to do because you're going to have a lot more options available. You're going to be much more effective at controlling those weeds uh, before the trees are in place. So that's really great to do. Um, now, kind of on the opposite end, um, when you are thinking about thinning um, or when you think that some of your trees might be aging and there might be some openings, Think about what are you going to do when you get those openings? Weeds are going to come in. More than likely, um, all plant growth will increase. You'll have more sunlight on the forest floor, but a lot of those plants are going to be weeds. So what are you going to do? What's your weed control plan? Um, and then when you're controlling weeds around trees, um, I think probably the most important thing to think about is the roots of the tree. Don't, you know, you don't want to damage the roots through digging. Um, right around the drip line, right around the tree. Um, compaction is really bad, bringing on equipment on the wet soils, doing you know, too much ground pulling right around your trees. You wanna minimize that um, whenever possible. Um, and then when you're thinking about the growth of the tree over time, the first couple of years, first few years of that tree's growth is really essential for a big healthy tree. So when you're doing weed control um, in those first few years, it's really important to reduce competition for your tree. Um, if you can't control the weeds when the trees are bigger, it's not gonna have as much impact on tree growth. But those first few years are really critical um, for the long-term health of those trees. Um, and then finally, remember the seed bank. What was there before the trees is likely to come back after you cut the trees down or there's some kind of disturbance. Seeds are very long-lived, some of them really incredibly long-lived, like scotch broom. Um, and so typically, once you have trees go down, you're going to have new weeds come up. So really important to think about. All right, and the other things um, that I really like people to consider is when you're controlling weeds, 
you're actually reducing or temporarily reducing bird and wildlife habitat because all plants provide some good, right? Um, so think about reducing that short-term impact by when you do your weed control. If you know you have big blackberry thickets that are full of bird nests in the spring, consider controlling your blackberry in the fall or the winter when those birds are done with their nesting. Um, if you know you have a lot of bees, um, maybe you have hives or your neighbors do, or there's just a lot of pollinators hanging out on your blackberry blossoms or whatever flowers you have, um, if you do your weed control before the flowers open or after the flowers wilt, then you allow those bees to have that habitat that one last time. Um, and then for sure protect any existing native trees and plants as much as possible and replace the invasive weeds with good beneficial species um, for the wildlife or the bees that you have. Um, so if you follow these steps, then you can really have minimal impact on your bees. All right, so weed control, the best kind of weed control is the stuff you never have to do, right? So prevention is really good. It's very effective, takes very little work. And the other thing, of course, is rapidly responding, detecting new infestations early before they become widespread. Um, some of the tips you can think about is if you're planting, um, if you have a landscape area, a garden area, use non-invasive species because seeds are gonna spread by wind, by water, um, berries being eaten by birds, and then the birds fly off into your woods and spread those weeds, those plants. Um, garden clippings dumped in the woods. A lot of times we have like a little yard waste pile next to our houses and those plants sometimes spread from your pile of yard waste. Um, so that's really critical. The other thing is be kind of a detective, like what's growing on your property and follow the areas that weeds are gonna path, the pathways for the weeds. So roads, trails, streams, ditches, um, any fence lines, um, areas where birds are gonna roost, like up on ridge lines, um, any logged or disturbed areas. These are all um, hot spots for new invasions um, of different weeds. Um, also, again, knowing the history of the site. So, you know, if you have an area that had scotch broom in the past and there's a disturbance up there, that's a likely place that, that you're gonna see scotch broom come back. Um, and then absolutely critical, clean vehicles and equipment that comes through your property that goes from site to site, maybe goes from a, a weed infested area to an area that doesn't have weeds, um, your boots, you know, your animals, all these things are gonna be vectors that are gonna spread the weeds around. All right, so let's get into some weed control methods. Um, typically, um, manual control is really um, the most important method that most of us are gonna use, right? This is basically um, the um, targeted removal of weeds. And you can use some really great tools out there. There's you know, digging forks, uh, hori hori, you'll see a little picture of that there. Um, the weed wrench in this photo. Um, there's lots of great um, tools out there. Um, but the key for manual control to make it effective is to use the right tool for the job and to know what's going on with your plant. Like is the, are the roots small enough to be fully removed? Um, and, that, and then after you remove the weeds, are you disturbing the soil and getting a big flush of new weeds? So it's super important to watch for that. Um, and I always point people to what's going on underground. Okay, your roots are really the critical part. So knowing what kind of root system your weeds have, um, does it have just a fibrous root that pulls out really easily? Or does it have a really thick tap root that if you break it off, it just re-sprouts? Um, does it have little bulbs or tubers that are gonna break off the main root as you pull it out? Um, or does it have rhizomes? You know, we were talking in the chat about knotweed. Well, knotweed has rhizomes, which means it's like a stem growing underground with all these growing points, all these buds. So if you break that up, if you don't remove it all, you've just created more plants. You know, it's a great way to spread your weeds is by chopping up your rhizome and then you've just divided your, your weed into many, many weeds. Um, so that's really critical to know. All right, now, if you can't dig, the second thing to think about is cutting. 
right? Mowing, cutting, clipping, um, mechanical control. What this does is it, it reduces the weeds vigor without disturbing the soil. And that's really helpful if you have established forest because then you're not disturbing the roots as much. Um, I will say that cutting most tough weeds will not kill them, um, but it does reduce their, their strength. So if you're just looking to get your trees up above some weeds, blackberry thickets, keep them cut back so that things can grow over them, um, regular cutting is actually a super useful tool to think about. Um, the one thing to, to caution you against is, well, two things. If your weeds have seeds and you mow them, it can spread the seeds around and create more problems. And if you're cutting a plant that spreads by stem fragments, then cutting it might actually spread it. So some of the examples are knotweed again. Um, we'll talk about yellow archangel. Some of these plants actually can root from stem fragments. So you don't really want to mow those. But things like blackberry thickets, those are pretty good for mowing regularly. Um, and then another method is mulching. And this is more useful for kind of small, discrete infestations where you have, you know, maybe a flat area that you can just cover up with a wood chip mulch. Great to just chip up your, your woody weeds and or your, even your, your native trees that you've trimmed. Um, and just use that as a mulch. Um, it's great for soil building um, and it can kill quite a few, especially smaller weeds are pretty easy to control that way. Um, if you use a fabric like a tarp or a plastic, um, make sure to keep it exposed enough that you can find it so that you can remove it later because otherwise it just kind of breaks up into lots of little pieces and it's, uh, it's a real pain. So um, those are both methods for starving the plant. You know, it doesn't get any sunlight, so it can't make any more energy eventually um, most weeds will, will die um, in time <laughs> if you do that. All right, and then um, chemical control, it's, it's part of our uh, integrated pest management toolbox. Um, some people just make a decision not to use herbicides. Um, I will say for some of the large landowners with large infestations, um, this is just a really important tool to, con to, to have in your toolbox um, as an option. Um, but if you're gonna use an herbicide, realize this is a chemical that's been designed to work in a really specific way. Um, so it's really important to read the label and actually understand what it's saying and figure out, is this the tool for my job? Is this going to be um, a product that's going to work on my weed and my situation? And is it legal to use it here? Um, does it describe my situation? Um, if it doesn't, don't use it. Um, there's some really kind of strict laws about what you can spray, where you can spray them. Um, you may need a license, you may need a permit. Um, always keep good records of what you've done so you can show what you've done in case there's any problems, but also so you can know yourself. Did it work? Should I do something different? Um, there's something called the safety data sheet, which will give you information about what to do in case of a spill. Um, what if you get it on you? What are the risks to, to human health and animals? Um, so always, always use the most effective rate and timing but you know, use extra caution if there's any consideration, concern about water, other plants, people, that sort of thing. So um, it's, it's a tool that can work really well in some situations, but you have to really know what you're doing um, if you're gonna go this route. All right, and then specifically around forests, around trees, I recommend the uh, Pacific Northwest Weed Management Handbook. Um, there's a section on forestry, it's really helpful. Um, some of the things that it, it recommends is conifers are, you know, more at risk to herbicides in spring and summer. Um, higher rates can really easily injure trees. Um, the, the things that you add to the herbicide, the surfactants, the spreader stickers, this can increase the conifer um, injury. Um, and then really important is to think about herbicides that can be moved up into the um, tree through the soil. So, the drip zone of a desirable tree is a really uh, place to be really cautious about what you spray. If your herbicide says that it's soil active or very mobile <laughs> um, and very active in the soil, that's something that you want to avoid um, in a forest situation. Okay, let's get on to the um, specific weeds that I have tonight. Now, I don't have all of the weeds. I don't have horse tail. I don't probably have some of the weeds you want me to talk about, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna try to focus on the ones that are the biggest impact, you know, are um, 
Western Washington mostly. Um, so we have a few woody weeds. They're really big troublemakers over here. I'll start with those. Um, our number one kind of problem plant um, is Himalayan blackberry. This is the, the really robust blackberry uh, thickets that you see everywhere. Um, it was introduced into uh, North America um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and has since um, escaped quite vigorously throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, so it's very common. I'm sure you have some. Um, the berries are delicious, but it does make a huge uh, nuisance of itself. Very sharp thorns, very large stems. Um, the canes can be um, eight feet tall, it can spread 15 feet in a single year. Um, it's just an amazing plant, very, very vigorous. Um, and then we have another uh, European blackberry that is also very vigorous and very invasive, uh, but people maybe aren't as familiar with it. Um, it's called evergreen blackberry or cut leaf blackberry. Um, the leaves look like somebody took the Himalayan blackberry, I'll show you that again. Those leaves, there's like five uh, leaflets in a clump. It's the same for the evergreen, but it's the, the leaves are all kind of lacy looking or cut up. So that's called cut leaf blackberry. Um, they're both European, they're both very invasive, um, and they grow in really similar places. I would say sometimes the cut leaf blackberry seems to grow like where the Himalayan blackberry is a little bit um, less vigorous. So kind of it's that niche, but together they seem to just occupy all possible areas. Um, and I pretty much would just treat them the same. They um, are, you know, controlled in the same way and they do the same impacts. Um, but don't confuse these um, non-native blackberries with our native blackberry. So we have a little trailing blackberry that's really um, small leaves, they're in threes, the um, stems are narrow. Um, and it tends to trail along the ground. Um, it's really good for habitat and wildlife, love it. Um, and it won't interfere with your um, you know, forest. It's actually part of our, our ecosystems here, our forest ecosystems. Um, if you've got some new trees, it might cause a little bit of problem in new plantings, but you can kind of just keep it back. Um, there's really no reason to control it. Um, and then we also have some native berries like thimbleberry and salmonberry and, uh, black cap raspberry. So I guess just because it's got thorns and berries, um, don't assume it's it's the non-native blackberry. Um, we really just have those two main uh, Himalayan blackberry and cut leaf blackberry that are the real aggressors in our area. All right, so what are some of the impacts? Probably don't need to tell you this, but like I said before, it forms impenetrable thickets. It's very large, reduces habitat diversity, um, creates obstacles for wildlife and people, um, and your trees. You can just completely um, cover over an area so that trees can't grow as well. So what are you gonna do? Blackberry control. Um, first, you need to sit back and you need to think, what do you have the ability to maintain? It will be very difficult to control blackberry and you probably need to do multiple, um, you know, control efforts over several years. Um, so just take on what you can control. Um, and then the other thing is to think about your goal. Is it, is it something that you need to eliminate or can you just cut it back several times a year? So my favorite method for blackberry control is just regular cutting, regular clipping that will reduce its figure to the point where it's just kind of an annoyance and not a big deal. Um, you can do this with uh, brush cutters, Goats are good for eating the leaves and some of the new shoots, um, hand tools. Uh, but then if you are just tired of cutting it all the time, you can dig up the main root crowns. They're usually lots of small rooted stems and then some that are, have really big roots. And those are woody and they're deep. And so you really need to dig down and get those roots out. Um, if you want to use um, an herbicide mix for this uh, plant, um, you can just spray the full grown blackberry. Um, but the product you use depends on the season. So if you're going to use glyphosate, which is what's in Roundup, that works in the fall. If you were going to use triclopyr, which is in Garlon and Crossbow, that's more of a spring or summer. Um, so that really depends. But if herbicide seems like you don't want to use, I mean, that's a lot of spray, you can cut the plants down, 
let them regrow to about two feet tall, and then spray them, spray the regrowth. So that's fairly effective as well. So those are kind of the, some different methods that you can consider, just depending on what you have, um, what your interests are and what your goals are. All right, moving on to scotch broom. Now scotch broom is also very common. We have a lot of it, um, but it's gonna be in the more sunny areas. So the real problem with scotch broom is in the regrowth of forests. Um, once the forest canopy closes up, you're not gonna have much of it, but you're definitely gonna have it in the younger forests and in the cleared areas. Um, scotch broom was introduced from Europe um, and has just spread considerably along the Pacific Northwest. Huge impact on, on timber production in Washington and Oregon. Um, it can increase the risk and intensity of fires and it displaces um, native vegetation as well as reducing forage uh, for elk and, and livestock. Um, and the, one of the big take home messages for, for scotch broom is the seeds remain viable for a really long time. So we're seeing it come back, you know, decades of, of forest growth, you clear the forest and then scotch broom comes back. Uh, so what do you do? Um, well, with scotch broom, first, try not to disturb the soil too much because that will make more seedlings come up. Um, but the nice thing about it is that scotch broom has uh, roots that just go pretty much straight down. And so young plants, like under three feet tall, can be hand-pulled pretty easily. And you could get the whole root out and actually do a really good job at controlling those little plants. So that's super effective. Um, once a plant gets too big to pull, um, you can do one of, well, three things. If you have just scattered plants, not a lot of them, you can get a hold of one of these tools called a weed wrench, or there's a couple of other brand names out there now, and it basically just clamps onto the base of the scotch broom. You lean back, and then it levers the roots out of the ground. It works really easily um, and really well on these big scotch broom plants. Um, but the downside is you've kind of churned up the soil and you might get a lot of seedlings. So, or on a steep slope, you're not really gonna be able to do that um, very easily. So in those situations, for the older scotch broom plants, you can cut them near the ground level, especially in the summer, it's the most effective time, a lot of those scotch broom will die. Some will re-sprout, but not as many as if you cut them in the, in the winter time. Um, and so, and then the third method is herbicide. So this is a situation where you can either cut the stems and spray concentrated herbicide on the cut stump, or you can spray the entire plants, but that's gonna require a lot of herbicide. Um, and it only works when the plant still has leaves on it. So that's gonna be earlier in the season. Um, Scotch broom is one of those funny plants that tends to lose its leaves in the summer and it's a response to drought. So that makes it easier for it to survive the drought. All right, moving on to another woody plant is English holly. Um, English holly, first of all, it's, we consider it invasive when it has, invades into forest and takes over. Um, but it is also a crop in Washington state and it's not a noxious weed. It's not on the state noxious weed list. Um, it's a plant that we consider invasive when it creates uh, problems in forests. Um, so this is the same species that you would use, you know, in your Christmas decorations. Uh, but unfortunately, birds have eaten those berries in very many places in, in Western Washington, and we're seeing forests uh, become choked with English holly. So first and foremost, make sure what you have is holly and not Oregon grape. So Oregon grape's a native shrub with little holly-like leaves, but the leaves grow in pairs. And so you'll see that on the, the photo there, whereas holly leaves are actually alternate, which means they grow at different spots on the stem. All right, well, holly control, what are you gonna do? Um, holly is one of the many plants that will re-sprout vigorously if you cut it. If you just cut the stems above the ground, you're gonna have a ton of new little shoots. Um, so you really are, are, you have to either dig up, pull up, remove however you can the roots as best you can. Um, and that's fairly effective if you can get the majority of the root out of the ground. You might get a little bit of re-sprout from some of those big roots, but if you can get most of the root out, um, it's, it's pretty effective. Um, or use um, an herbicide treatment on the stem itself. There's kind of three main ones that are used. 
um, the cut stump method, which is when you cut it completely, cut the tree down, and then spray or paint on a concentrated herbicide. Um, or the frilling or hack and squirt method, where you make little um, divots in the stem with your hatchet or whatever tool, and then put the herbicide into those cuts. Or the third method in this photo is called the Easy Jack Lance, and it's a tool that is spring loaded and it, and it brooks these little kind of uh, pellets of herbicide into the trunk of the tree. And then it releases the herbicide slowly over time uh, into the tree itself. It's very effective and very fast, uh, but those uh, tools do cost a fair amount of money. So um, there's some different options depending on your situation and, and how much you have, um, but you know, all fairly effective. The best uh, methods are the cut stump method or the easy jack lance. Um, the one in the middle there, the Hackett squirt, it's not always that good. Holly has a tendency to just re-sprout from below um, the damage. All right, moving on to English ivy. Um, this is our main vine um, that we have that's a problem in our forests. Um, it's an evergreen vine. I'm sure you're familiar with seeing it around in landscaped areas, but it also again spreads into forests, usually uh, birds carrying berries or landscape areas that spread from there. Um, there's two forms of ivy leaves. We've got the um, the main one that you see all over the top, all over the place, the, the dull green leaves with the light veins and the lobes. And then we have these side shoots that it makes when it matures. And those leaves are shiny. And that's all the same plant. It's all connected to the same root. Um, so sometimes people think they have two ivies. It's really all just one plant with two forms of leaves. Uh, ivy impacts in forests are really significant. So if there's one plant you really want to target, it would be ivy. Um, it can completely cover your trees and create a lot of damage to the trees themselves. And then it also creates a lot of damage in the understory. Um, it, it impedes the growth of tree seedlings as well as the native plants in the forest um, and can really kind of change the, the forest um, quite dramatically. Uh, English ivy control, um, usually it's non-chemical because it works really well. Um, you can first cut the vines that are growing on the trunk, make sure all the vines are cleared from the trunk of the tree. Um, and then pull the ivy out of the ground um, at least six feet away from the base of the tree. And you've pretty much controlled that bit of ivy on the tree. It won't survive if it doesn't have any roots in the ground. Um, and then ideally you'll go and you'll pull all the ivy that's growing on the ground as well. Um, and the roots are fairly sturdy, so they can be pulled out of the ground pretty easily. Um, uh, but sometimes if you have too much or you just don't have the labor to deal with all the ivy this way, um, you can use an herbicide. Um, the general recommendation these days is to combine glyphosate and triclopyr, make sure to add a surfactant that works on uh, waxy leaves, and then the timing seems to be summer to fall. Um, there's been some other um, attempts at different timing, but that seems to be the best. Right, our, our other invasive vine that you're also going to see sometimes is this deciduous one called Old Man's Beard or Clematis. It's got really stringy bark, fluffy white seed, uh, flower pods, uh, flower clusters, and um, deciduous leaves that are divided into to leaflets, into five leaflets. And we see it covering trees along some of our river areas and urban forests mostly, um, but sometimes we get it in our rural areas as well. And clematis control is pretty much, uh, old man's beard control is pretty much like ivy. Um, you've got the roots, um, you know, it's rooted in the ground and so you need to make sure to pick it up, uh, but you can combine cutting and chemical control um, just like you can with the ivy. Um, it's just that it's deciduous. And this is one of the plants where if you leave it on the ground, it can avoid the roots. So you have to collect um, all of the um, root fragments and stem fragments. All right, let's talk about just a few um, non-woody invasive plants. Um, there's lots that I could cover, but I wanted to mention garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is one of those um, noxious weeds I mentioned earlier that is, we still have the opportunity to maybe not eradicate it, but maybe keep it from becoming a, a big problem in Washington. So 
this is one that would be great for you to look for and to let your county weed board know if you see it. Um, it's got white flowers. Um, it's already seeded out for the year, um, but generally it, it is pretty visible in April and May. Uh, it has big, big impacts on the forest understory um, and on the tree health itself. It's edible to people, but wildlife don't eat it. Um, for identification, you kind of have to combine all these characters, okay? So it has white flowers, always white. It has um, leaves, the young leaves are rounded with little scalloped edges. Um, the seed pods are long and skinny, and the roots are crooked, usually curved or, or L-shaped, and it has kind of a garlicky smell to it. It's actually a mustard, it's not garlic, but it has kind of a garlicky smell. So those are kind of the characters you're looking for to identify it. Um, and unfortunately, there's lots of plants that look like garlic mustard, so this makes it complicated. But if you keep in mind that garlic mustard leaves are smooth to the touch, not fuzzy or hairy, that really helps. So a lot of the lookalikes, things like uh, fringe cup and avens or nettles, I don't even have that put on here, um, nipplewort, these are all fuzzy leaved plants. So that's a good character to look for. Um, so garlic mustard, like I said, it's very invasive in forests. It can completely cover the ground. Um, it spreads rapidly by seed. It doesn't even need pollination. It can just go crazy um, from a single plant. Um, lots of areas that we had small patches have then since become large infestations because the seeds um, get carried by people, by water, um, deer, um, dogs, everything you can imagine. This is an example, there was a, a, a log where people would sit and brush their boots off after working, um, pulling garlic mustard. And the next year, lo and behold, all these old garlic mustard plants popped up. So, I mean, this was great because it showed us that we really need to brush our boots or we're gonna track this garlic mustard elsewhere. Um, and it also showed us that it worked, right? We were brushing our boots and it worked. The, the seeds dropped off. And fortunately, this log was right next to the known infestation, so we were able to get rid of it. Um, just a couple of shots of it in Whatcom County, Seattle. It doesn't care if it's a disturbed or an intact forest. Um, it's, it's just a really aggressive plant. Um, we really encourage people to report it. Um, that's just how we find a lot of the garlic mustard out there. All right, moving on to yellow archangel. I mentioned this before, this plant is usually one that people don't know the name of necessarily, um, but they, they think it looks pretty until they have it growing in their forest. And it almost always spreads by unintentional spreading through clippings or yard waste dumping, or if somebody throws their hanging basket in the forest and then it grows out from there. Um, just so often it comes from unintended um, you know, spread by somebody. Get something like this, where yellow archangel just grows out over the carpet, over the, the forest, and then just slowly but surely outcompetes um, all the other plants. Um, it's really hard to get rid of. When you have acres of yellow archangel, um, it looks kind of pretty in its own way, but you can see it just has this dramatic impact on the diversity of the forest. Um, and it's a very um, vigorous growing plant. It's evergreen, grows all year round, um, and it's really hard to kill. Um, so be very persistent. It's kind of like blackberry. It's going to take repetitive effort. Um, you could hand pull it, but the roots do break off because they're very delicate roots and then it re-sprouts from the roots. Um, so if you have kind of a loose forest soil, um, hand pulling can be fairly effective if you're really careful, uh, but you will need to gather all those stems to make sure they don't um, fall back to the ground and create more plants. Um, you can use the covering method where you take a heavy, you know, covering car, like a cardboard and wood chips or a fabric. Um, but it's, it's really um, amazing plant. It can live for a long time in 100% darkness. So you're going to need to have a really good covering that doesn't allow any light to get through um, for quite some time. Um, and then herbicide, generally um, herbicide needs to be repeated for it to be effective. Um, most chemicals won't kill all the plants and then it'll regrow. So you need to treat more than once. Um, we found the best results with the same combination that worked on the ivy, which is mixing glyphosate and triclopyr. Um, there's some other combinations that work as well. 
Um, but pretty much whatever you use, you're going to need to repeat it. Now, if you don't want to use um, typical herbicides and you want to use an organic product, um, some tests that uh, Tim Miller from WSU did was um, discovered that the vinegar-based herbicides, we're talking legal herbicides that have uh, vinegar acetic acid in them, um, these ones were more effective than the clove or other types of organic uh, herbicides. Um, however, it was just short term, like every couple of weeks, um, the plants would grow back and you would need to reapply it. So, but in terms of organic products, that's what he found was the most effective. All right, moving on to Herb Robert, which I know like probably everybody here has. And the question is, you know, Herb Robert, is it a lost cause? Should we even focus on it? Um, I'll, I'll let you make that call. Um, we have a lot of Herb Robert in Washington, that's true. Um, it's, a, it's this geranium that was introduced from Europe as a pretty little garden plant and it just spread like crazy. Um, now it's everywhere. It's a very smelly, it has pretty pink flowers. Um, the character that I think is the most important for identifying it, other than the smell, is the, the hairy stems because there are the plants that look similar. So look for those lacy leaves, hairy stems, smelly plant. Um, and that'll help you distinguish it from our native plant, bleeding heart, which looks very similar, very lacy. They both grow in shady areas. Um, so keep an eye out for that when you're pulling the herb robber. Don't, you know, pull the name of the plant state. Um, Speaking of control, <laughs> um, Herb Robert, uh, fortunately, it, it is an annual. It does have just a fibrous root system. So individual plants are super easy to pull out. Just grab the base of the plant, pull it out, and it's dead. Um, although don't just drop it back on the ground because it'll probably just regrow. Um, but if you have a carpet of it, um, you're, you're kind of stuck um, with either using like a, a mulch um, on it to, to just suffocate it or using an herbicide when it's young. So most annual weeds, if you spray them, um, your best timing for an annual weed is when it first is just a new little plant before it flowers. Um, so keep that in mind if that's, if that's what you're trying to do. Um, that, but that's where you might just decide, okay, this is, this is a weed I'm just gonna have to tolerate. Um, I just have too much of it. And maybe it'll be lower on your list of priorities. Uh, but it does have an effect of um, possibly suppressing seed germination of other plants. So if you get enough of it, it could have an impact on your forest. All right, just a few more plants here. We have tansy ragwort, which is toxic to horses and cattle and isn't normally considered a forest weed, but we do have it in, in clearings, kind of like scotch broom. It seems to follow the roads, the trails, um, the cleared areas, um, it can just like explode in any kind of openings. Um, so keep your eyes out for it. It's, it's flowering right now. Um, it's one that spreads rapidly by seed. Um, and like I said, it is toxic uh, to animals. Um, it has a two-year growth cycle. It's kind of got those first year clumps that we call rosettes. And then it has a second year plant that flowers with little daisy flowers. And the flowers have petals and yellow centers. So it's like a daisy. Um, keep that in mind if you're trying to identify it. It can be helpful. Um, tansy ragwort control, um, it can be dug up, it can be hand pulled, um, it, can, it can be treated with an herbicide in the fall or spring. Um, but one really important thing to remember is when it's in full flower and you cut it or you pull it, it can go to seed and those seeds will stay viable. Um, it's also toxic when it's dry. So it's best to control it before it flowers. Um, when it, it's in flower, we often recommend actually bagging up and throwing away all the flower. Um, sometimes people confuse tansy ragwort with common tansy. Common tansy is a different plant. It's, um, it's also a weed. It's not like something you necessarily want, but it's not that invasive in um, you know, good pastures and it also isn't gonna create a problem in any kind of forest setting. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. It has the little button lung flowers instead of the daisies. All right, just a couple of thistles because people often ask me about thistles. Um, this is the type of plant that you're going to see in a clearing. Um, if you thin your forest, if there's a, uh, some fallen trees, um, openings often get some thistles. And we have two main non-native thistles that are really invasive in Western Washington, actually over in Eastern Washington as well. 
Um, Eastern Washington's got a whole slew of invasive thistles, but over here we mainly have Canada thistle and bull thistle. Um, Canada thistle is the creeping thistle with the deep roots and the creeping rhizomes. Um, so pretty much it's not something you're going to hand pull. Um, regular cutting or just suppressing it with a, a, an herbicide um, is actually all you really need to do. You don't need to kill it entirely in order for your forest to be healthy. Um, just keep it from impacting the young trees. Um, so this is Canada thistle. I really like just the regular cutting of this one. And then we have bull thistle, which is a biennial thistle. It does not have creeping roots. You can actually just dig up bull thistle. Um, that works pretty well. Um, but if you have a lot of it, you might try just cutting it um, when it's in bud um, or when it's you know, already bolted up a bit um, and just get as much of the root out as you can, like dig it just a little bit or cut it really low to the ground. Um, and that can usually keep it at bay um, and keep it from going to seed. Um, I will mention that there are a couple of native thistles that um, grow in woodlands, especially um, in Western Washington. I'm pretty familiar with them. Um, they do look a little bit like bull thistle. So if you're looking um, at the flower in this photo, you'll see it just has those spines under the flower. And the native thistles have what looks like kind of woolly hairs all wound around the spines. Uh, but the other thing is the native thistle, the stem is not spiny, but in bull thistle, it has um, spines on the stem. So watch out for that. Um, try not to control the natives if you're not, not trying to. Um, all right, so moving on to our last plant is uh, knotweed. Now invasive knotweed is a, is a group of three different types of knotweed, but they're all kind of look the same. Um, it's a very tall plant that some people call bamboo but it's actually in the buckwheat family. Um, and it's an herbaceous plant, which means that the stems die each year and then regrow from the roots. So unlike bamboo, bamboo is woody and you always have the stems. So knotweed is a, a very fast growing, very vigorous plant that if you have it, it is just a nightmare to deal with and it will suppress pretty much any other plants. Um, the situations um, in wooded areas, mostly you're going to see it in floodplains, um, areas that are somewhat wet or that might get flooded on a regular basis, like this alder forest. Um, and you'll see in this photo, the knotweed is pretty much the only plant. And if you take the knotweed away, which is what we did, there was nothing underneath those trees. It was completely suppressing all other plants. So that's the kind of situation you get. It can be very unhealthy in a riparian forest um, along you know, shores of, of areas. So how do you get rid of knotweed? Um, we gotta understand how it grows. It's very rapid growth in the spring. And then in the summer and the fall, it stores root energy. So knowing that about the plant can help you control it. It also spreads by root and stem fragments. And so avoiding mowing, avoiding moving the roots around or disturbing the soil where it's growing, um, these are all things to, to think about. Um, we have very few methods that work on uh, knotweed control, um, and a lot depends on how wet the soil is, how large the infestation is, um, what your options are available. Um, we have put some really good videos on our website that explain the different control methods, um, but we basically have the non-chemical control options for small patches, um, which would be like digging it up if it's in loose soil, um, most like that's not going to work. If the plants have been around for a while, the roots can go as deep as six to seven feet deep, um, so that's not usually very effective. Um, cutting it several times a month all year for up to five to seven years is another method. Um, covering it with heavy fabric um, five plus years, um, it needs to be installed in order for that to work. Um, so the other option is go to chemicals, um, and there we're limited as well in terms of what works. Um, if you use the stem injection method, um, we're limited to using glyphosate. It's the only one that's labeled for that use. Um, you have to inject every stem. Super effective, concentrates the herbicide into the knotweed, but on the other hand, it takes a long time to do that work, um, and it does come back a little bit the next year. Um, or you can spray the entire leaves and stems um, in the summer to fall. So those are kind of the options available. 
Um, there's just not a lot I can say about novelty. This is really hard to kill. All right, so that's all the weeds that I have for you guys. Um, you might have questions. I unfortunately don't have the chat box available. I, I was able to find it um, before, but I don't have it now. Um, so I'm gonna rely on Brendan and um, Kevin to share questions that you guys might have. Uh, but I will recommend, um, the, again, the Washington State Weed Board website is a really valuable resource. Uh, our website has, I mentioned those not weed videos and lots of other resources. Um, and you can find your county weed board um, websites as well on the state website. So those are all really good uh, resources for you. All right, so um, Kevin or, or Brandon, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to entertain them. All right, thank you, Sasha. Always nice to have you with us. I learn something new every time. Uh, a lot of the questions we've been able to address in the chat box, but there are some that we have uh, held for you. Uh, Brendan, do you have any in front of you right now? I uh, no, I'm looking through. We did a pretty thorough job with the two of us in the chat box. Uh, if anyone has any further questions or any of the questions that you did ask and you weren't fully satisfied with the answer, maybe uh, type them in now. Uh, there was some questions about composting uh, herb Robert. And our response was with a worry about getting seeds into the compost, but they shouldn't re-sprout if you bury them in compost. Is that correct, Sasha? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I, uh, the seeds are very long-lived and people have had a hard time, you know, they put them in the compost and they just seem to get them coming back from the compost. So if you're going to not spread the compost around, it might be okay to try that, um, like have a spoils area where you put your weeds and never move it around. Um, but yeah, if you're going to use that compost again later, I wouldn't put herb Robert in it. Right. That's fairly true with most invasive weeds. If it's something that's really nasty, well, like Kevin said, a lot of weeds you could leave out on your driveway or your road, let them fully dry out and die, and then maybe use them. But if you, there's any chance there's seeds on them, don't put them in there. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and I'm kind of liking the um, the idea of like having these little spoils areas instead of you know, burning or taking them off to the, to the, you know, transfer station or something. It's nice to be able to let it just decompose on site. It's just that you don't right. want to turn that around. Yeah, and so while people are thinking, um, we have um, a couple of ways to get a hold of us. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. I don't have my personal uh, email on here, but it's just my name, which is sasha.shaw at kingcounty.gov. And you can always um, follow us, follow us on Instagram. And, Get our get our app on the apps Google Play. So we always like to get reports of noxious weeds from folks, uh, things that you're seeing out there. Or like I said, for Washington, there's the Washington Invasives app, um, and that goes right to the Invasive Species Council, and they'll follow up on those. And Athena had a question about she was wanting to set up an invasive species control and mitigation group on her campus down in Pierce County, and. Uh, I suggested she contact Pierce County Noxious Weeds and Pierce Conservation Districts. Do you have any other groups down there that you know of that might be willing to partner with that? Uh, that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Forterra has done some green Tacoma mm. city projects. Um, they might have um, some good leads as well. Um, Forterra is spelled F-O-R-T-E-R-R-A. They're a nonprofit that works um, mostly in Pierce County, King County, and Snohomish County, I think. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and anywhere else, you have whatever your local land trust happens to be, which in those areas is Forterra, are generally good partners in projects like that. Yeah. Uh, John asked if this course will be eligible for credit for the pesticide license. No, I did not get that continuing education credit for this one. For yeah, we have a webinar possible. tomorrow night. Um, it's technically sold out, but um, it's worth two credits and you might see if you can register for it. I think we tried to add some extra spaces. Um, That's right. I meant to plug that in the earlier session as well. It's, but, yeah, uh, it's okay. It filled up. We only, uh, we only have the hundred. Um, right. <laughs> we're cheapskates here at King County. But anyway, so if you go to the kingcounty.gov slash weeds classes page, um, you might be able to still sign up for that uh, for tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, V. Ellison asks, if one uses vinegar as an herbicide, does it change the pH of the soil? If yes, for how long? 
Um, I have not heard that it changes the pH of the soil. Now we're not using vinegar itself. We're using um, herbicides that have vinegar in them as an active ingredient. And it will say on the label um, how much to use so that it's safe for the environment and the site. Um, you definitely don't want to overuse anything ever. <laughs> um, that's why they have labels to tell you what's a safe amount to use. Um, but just in general, vinegar um, is very dilute and tends to get um, washed away pretty quickly. So um, it, it could eventually, I suppose, have an impact, but it's a, it's a easily diluted substance. Yeah. I would yeah. say the answer the label, though- really... Follow the label of the product that you're using. Yeah, and the answer to using actual vinegar is it depends entirely how much and what concentration you use. So yeah, and I I just I really like using um, herbicides that have the ingredients you want in them, like vinegar, because then it's got instructions on how to make it work. Um, yes, it's just, you're, it's just a crapshoot if you use regular vinegar, like how much you use and when you use it, and um, how to stay safe. So yeah, I get a lot of questions from people about legal oh, rules. <laughs> oh, What's sorry. that? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. You cut out on my end for a moment. Uh, oh, I was just I, saying it is it is the, the state law and the federal law that you can't um, use a product to kill things without a label. You know, that's, yes, that is the true. Label is the law. <laughs> I'll, I'll add a caution about the, the concentrated vinegar. You know, I, I think people can easily become complacent and not, uh, you know, treat the chemical sort of with the respect that it uh, deserves in terms of um, you know, the, the, the hazards of it. This is, this is a concentrated acid. It's not like what you cook with. And you know, if you read the label of what it can do if it gets on your skin or what it can do if it gets in your eyes, uh, just because it's organic, uh, you still have to follow the label and the instructions and, and look at the hazards as, as well. It's still a chemical. Yeah, most of the organic herbicides have very um, high risk to eyes and skin because yeah. they are working as kind of a contact kill, kind of a contact herbicide. So yeah, just because it doesn't make it safe. <laughs> and I get asked often about homemade herbicides, which like Sasha just said, are technically illegal. But also yeah. keep in mind that just because it's a technically natural product doesn't mean it can't have really serious consequences on your land. Uh, and often the things that people spread out there, which are you know passed down from their grandparents, mixtures of lime and baking soda and lye and a whole bunch of other stuff are far, far worse for your soil and your plants and your native ecologies than any herbicide you're ever going to find. Yeah. So, I, I've had people suggest that we use salt to kill right. weed. That's a horrible thing to do your soil. Perfect example. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I've found a couple of questions here that we haven't addressed yet. Um, so Olga asks, as I know it's not a weed question, how to control brush. Uh, our favorite answer, it depends on what your goals are and situation. Uh, you might want to look at the recording of the site preparation webinar we did uh, a week or two ago and you can uh, contact me and I can get you a link to that if you weren't on that webinar. Uh, so there's a question, uh, not weed, what was the alternative type of chemical from glyphosate and its method to use? Um, that would be imazapyr, I-M-A-Z-A-P-Y-R. Imazapyr is an active ingredient that's found in a few, some products that are used in forestry and then some products that are used in wetlands. So we usually use uh, Polaris or Habitat, which are used in wetlands, but you need um, you know, an aquatic license to apply them and purchase that. Um, but that, that's the most effective chemical for knotweed by far. Okay. Uh, Olga asked, there's a variety of scotch broom. I'm on the east side of the state. Uh, Cytisus sister redhead scotch broom. No ship, West Coast, approximately seven inches. I assume that's the technical description of it. They're selling it on eBay with red colors. Do you know anything <laughs> about that? Um, yeah, um, regular old Scotch broom that we have on the West Side um, has some variation in its color. Um, and so sometimes you get just regular old Scotch broom with red flowers. 
but there's also there's also some hybrids out there cultivars that have used scotch broom and mixed it with some other brooms to get these cool colors um, so the one that he has i'm not sure if it's a hybrid or if it's just a, a cultivar of regular old scotch broom but it probably says don't ship to the west because um, it would still produce seeds that would be invasive um, in western washington um, but scotch broom is a little bit cold sensitive um, I've heard that it's not at all invasive in the Midwest United States because it just dies in the winter. Um, so it could be that there's parts of Eastern Washington that it's not that invasive. I know um, Kittitas County is uh, aggressively controlling Scotch broom um, as it you know, moves over on the highway. So, but there are probably areas of Eastern Washington that are too cold. Sasha, we got a couple of grass questions. Uh, first question is, should one be concerned about sticky grass and then another one any recommendations on control of reed canary grass ah yes well I'll take the reed canary grass first um, reed canary grass typically grows in wet wetlands and so you're gonna it's kind of like knotweed you're gonna have to know like you know what are the permitting and legal requirements for um, how to treat it um, and then the other thing is it's kind of like blackberry in that if you're not able to maintain what you've controlled it comes back with a vengeance so um, long-term uh, control of reed canary grass really is shade. So the deeper, you know, shade, the, the more densely you plant your willows or alders, um, the less uh, reed canary grass you're going to have. But it does, it really does help to control it um, first, either suppress it with um, really heavy mulch, um, herbicide, you pretty much have to use an herbicide like glyphosate um, to kill uh, reed canary grass or mazapir, the same stuff that kills knotweed. Um, or, um, yeah, it's pretty much the only options. And then, yeah, heavy planting to, to suppress it from coming back. And then sticky grass, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, could refer to some different plants. Um, it's funny, what comes to mind is uh, the sticky weed, the um, call it Velcro plant or um, gallium. Um, I can't remember the other common name. That's one that isn't a grass, but it does stick to you. I don't know if that's what they're they're asking about. Okay, there's a they're asking about. I don't uh, think so. The bed, bed dry is the gallium is the common name for gallium, dry, right? right? Yes. Uh, I don't think. Well, maybe I'm not sure what the sticky grass is. Uh, there's a question about best uh, way to get native replacement plants, and uh, my top recommendation would be your local conservation district's annual plant sale. And those usually happen end of February into March. And I would check your conservation district website uh, probably around early December and uh, see when the pre-order dates open up so you can get your first pick. Also, uh, Washington Native Plant Society does some native plant sales, different chapters as well. Uh, Sasha, how to control creeping buttercup? Yeah, creeping buttercup is um, going to grow in mostly sunny areas, but um, in either wet soil or really compacted soil. Sometimes um, think long term, like is this an area that is going to be wet and soggy and poorly drained forever? It might not be possible to get rid of the creeping buttercup um, unless you replace it um, with something um, taller. Um, if it's growing in lawns, grassy pastures, that area, um, it usually indicates that you might need to add some lime, but it won't kill the buttercup. It just might help the grass be healthier. Um, and if it's in a garden bed, just fork, you know, use a fork and digging tool in the, in the winter when the roots kind of die back a little bit. And it's usually you can get it out. You can also use a sheet mulch like a cardboard and wood chips or just wood chip mulch. Okay, uh, Raven Sarah asks about native plant salvage events. Are those still a thing? Uh, yeah, I think they are. I see uh, occasionally uh, announcements uh, for those, and and probably after we get you know through this pandemic, uh, I would expect we'll see some of those things start up again. The comment about using 100% white vinegar. I'm not even sure if you can 100% white vinegar is a thing. I don't know what. Ask anyway, but if you're using that kind of concentration, you have the potential to do real damage, and that's where you will start affecting your soil pH. Yeah, 
And 100% white vinegar may be referring to just your regular 5% food grade vinegar, well, no, uh, finding, not mixed with anything else. I'm finding things now at 75%. I mean, you can't have 100% acid. But yeah, yeah, uh, that would be an yeah, extremely but... caustic chemical. Right. You know, acetic acid in these concentrations, uh, these are actually predominantly used as industrial chemicals. Uh, right. And they are a uh, one of the co-products from oil refineries. So uh, some of that uh, higher concentration of acetic acid will will come as a, a byproduct of oil refining, and it's used in making paints and glues, and and all sorts of stuff. So. Organic and not a chemical is a chemical and just uh, treat it as such. Yeah, I'll just say again, look for a product that tells you how to kill plants, you know, because it's going to give you the instructions and the safety recommendations. It's always, you know, I know some people don't necessarily worry about following, you know, what the legal things are, but I'd say for your safety and for the effectiveness of the product, don't waste money, right? Buy an herbicide that has a label. Bruce asks, there was reference to an app. Does the app support taking a picture of the pet plant, letting you know if it's invasive, and then suggesting the fantastic info you gave tonight on in battling the blasted plants? That, that would just be a fabulous, fabulous app, wouldn't it? Um, not really. Um, certainly not this app, King County Connect, that I have here on the page. Um, but Wah Invasives, I don't think I have that an Invasives app. Um, both of them have a library of weeds, so you can look at photos of weeds and read a little bit about them, uh, but it won't identify your plant for you. Um, the best thing you can do is um, send a photo in, say it's unknown, um, or you can just email a photo to our email here, and sometimes we can just tell you what it is, a real live human being. <laughs> um, so it's, it's still really hard to get apps that effectively identify plants. Plants are just they're just very complicated and photos rarely capture enough details, um, but wow. she's really good at it. So um, most of the county weed boards have um, really friendly people who love plants. And so you can just email them photos and they'll tell you if it's invasive or not. Which are the ones that you don't think have really friendly people? Oh, they all do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, if, and if you have a doubt, just send it to the state weed board because that's uh, Wendy Deskamp is the education person there and she is very friendly, very nice. So she can very good. Well, we have a question about Scotch broom. Uh, Kay writes, we just removed dense mature Scotch broom using the cut and dab, the stump method. A couple questions. One, can it re-sprout from cut pieces of the stem or does it only re-sprout from seeds? And two, what to do with the cuttings? Um, it won't re-sprout from the part you cut off. Um, that's the nice thing about scotch broom is it's dead as soon as you cut it or pull it. Um, and the stump itself might re-sprout. Um, hopefully it won't. That method is pretty effective on scotch broom, but you might see some re-sprouting sometimes. Um, and then the plant part that you cut off, it's, um, it's inert, right? You can do what you want. You can chip it, you can burn it, you can make brush piles out of it. Um, the only thing I would caution you against is it does become somewhat flammable. So you don't wanna leave large piles um, as uh, fuel for fires, uh, especially near you know, dwellings or forests and that sort of thing. But the, the plant material can be disco discarded in any number of ways. Maybe chip it up and use it as mulch over the area that you have the scotch burn. Okay, and uh, what about using lime to kill buttercup? Um, yeah, so lime does not kill buttercup, um, but what lime will do is it will enrich the soil and make it less acidic. Um, and if that's, if you have an area that has say grass or other plants, um, it can help them grow better. Um, however, realize that there's some native plants that actually grow better in more acidic soil. And sometimes adding lime might actually increase um, the weed problem if you have a mostly native forest. So it won't kill the buttercup, but it will um, sort of tip the balance towards plants that like less acidic soil. And, and buttercup is really suited, it grows really well in acid soil. 
And Sasha, your thoughts on Tree of Heaven? Is this a is this an up and coming issue, and what to do about it? It's a good question. Um, Tree of Heaven is um, definitely around. Um, there's more of it invading um, in southern Washington, I believe, and in Oregon. Um, we have some in some of the cities um, here and there. It certainly does spread like a weed tree sometimes, um, but it's not that abundant. So the real concern about Tree of Heaven is that it's a host for the um, spotted lanternfly, I think I got the name right, um, which is an insect that hasn't shown up in Washington yet, but it could be devastating for a lot of crops um, in Washington. So the concern is more about Tree of Heaven as a host for uh, this insect. And so they're kind of monitoring trees of heaven to make sure that they don't you know, find the insect. Um, so it's kind of, kind of a gray area. I'm not sure if it's worth targeting it, you know, eradicating all the trees of, tree of heavens out there, um, but it's definitely worth looking at them and making sure they don't have this insect. Was that a waffly enough answer for you? Thanks, Sasha. Uh, let's see, Athena has a question about wet soils. Um, Athena, that, that might be a better one for you and I or Brendan to uh, tackle offline. It's a, a more involved answer. Uh, Banked asks, is there any literature on how often or frequently and for how many years to cut blackberries before they exhaust the energy in their roots? <laughs> um, that's variable. Um, I, I read that cutting them at least three, but more like four or five times a year is what's needed to really suppress them. Um, and uh, several years as a minimum to starve the roots out. Um, but that said, it kind of depends on how vigorous your blackberry is and how dry, you know, how dry it is. So, um, it seems in my experience that it just always comes back, but you know, maybe I'm not cutting it often enough. So um, more often cutting, drier soils, those will be in your favor. I'll, I'll, if you're up for digging out root crowns, I'll put in a plug for a forked mattock. I've oh, yes. found that those seem to perfectly grip blackberry root crowns. Yeah, you're definitely going to be more effective if you can dig out as much of the root as you can. Oh, and the reference to sticky grass earlier was, in fact, to the stickweed, the gallium. So, okay. But that is yeah, a native, isn't it? it? Yeah, it is. That's and, and, actually, that's one of those plants that they're debating if it's native or not. Mm. So um, I guess it depends if you like it or not. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's technically native, but there, it's a plant that occurs in Europe as well. And the theory is that maybe some of our more aggressive areas where it's taking over could be that it's the not native um, variety that's come in. But um, I don't worry about it unless it's uh, really just covering new plantings. If it's, if it's coating your new tree seedlings or new plants, it's really good to pull it off of them because it can become a bit of a problem. But generally, you don't need to control it you know, outside of that. OK, uh, Larry Lewis notes that. Uh... Uh, he's had success by with reed canary grass by uh, cutting it several times a year and allowing other grasses to grow above it and, and out compete it. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that because I used to, um, it's not really well adapted to frequent grazing. So the more you cut it, yeah, the more um, it's kind of like blackberry in that way. That's a really good suggestion. Okay. Um, is black locust a tree of concern? Uh, it's kind of in that gray area. Um, it, it can create big thickets um, through uh, root, you know, underground creeping roots. And so you can get these fairly large um, patches of black locust trees. So when it does that, it can, it can you know, create some impact. Um, but that's kind of an unusual thing in uh, Western Washington. It doesn't do that that often. So. Um, I would say it's one to watch. If you see it starting to really create giant thickets of itself, then maybe act, but otherwise a single tree on a farm or something like that is probably not a concern. All right, and 
then we had a question about what our education and backgrounds were that led us to this point. Kevin, do you want to recite your entire CV? Uh, well, I was going to say, you two, you and Sasha are the experts. I'm just a cheap hack. <laughs> Long for the ride. Um, I uh, have uh, two degrees in forestry and six years as a research forestry research scientist at the University of Washington and then 13 years as a faculty at WSU. Sasha, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I have a, a bachelor's in botany from the University of Washington. I took a lot of forestry classes. That was back in the mid 1990s. And then I've been working um, pretty much on noxious weeds and invasive plants, either controlling them or educating about them. Um, ever since then, I did work for the Washington Native Plant Society to, I guess, make amends for all the weed work um, for a little while. But pretty much I've just been in weeds forever. Fantastic. And uh, I have a bachelor's in ecology and evolutionary biology and a master's in forestry and forest ecology. And I've been here with WSU Extension Forestry for two and a half years now. All right. Uh, and uh, a question of, of about the forked mattock that I referred to. Uh, so a mattock is kind of like a, a cross between a hoe and a pickaxe. That's how I would describe it. It's usually got a, a flat blade on it. Uh, sometimes planting crews or fire crews will use those. And a forked mattock is one that um, typically will have a blade on one side and then like uh, uh, three sharp metal prongs on the other. And it's those, uh, those prongs that get nicely tangled in that uh, root crown and you can give it a good, good yank. Okay. Uh, so Athena, I think, is asking for clarification about, was that locust? Uh, just clarifying it isn't a problem until it becomes a thicket, and um, which would be defined as really close growth, not just multiple, but close and multiple. Uh, Sasha, can you clarify that? Um, yeah, that's what I would talk about. When you start seeing um, just many, many stems coming up in one area. And a uh, scotch broom question. Uh, Kay writes, our pulled scotch broom has attached black mature seed pods. Are those seeds in a brush pile a problem? Can we take the pile with the seeds to the landfill or burn it? Um, they're they're going to make new plants. So it depends on what you mean by a problem. If, that's a, if you piled up your scotch broom in an area where you already had scotch broom, it's probably not going to contribute that much more uh, to the seed bank. You already have seeds there. Um, so that might be my first choice. Um, burning isn't going to destroy the seeds. Um, so and that would only destroy the, the plants. And then taking it to the landfill, it's a lot of plant material. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of an extreme uh, thing to do, but it, it is something that you could do. Um, you could take it to the yard waste, uh, you know, it's clean green, but um, then you're just spreading the problem to other people. So um, I would recommend that. So my favorite is just to leave it where the seeds already are and then you're not creating more of a problem somewhere else. Ooh, Paula asks about vinca, which is actually, it's something I've been seeing more and more spreading out in certain areas of the woods. So have you been seeing that, Sasha? Um, yeah, vinca can spread. Um, the, the vinca minor that we have typically in Washington is not nearly as aggressive. In California, they have Vinca Major, and it does really just do a horrible number. Of, um, but Vinca Minor is a much more slower spreading problem. So I think typically where I've seen it, it's been spreading out from a planted area or a yard waste dump site, um, maybe an old homestead, um, and then just slowly spreading from there. So it's, it's easy, much easier to control than um, Yellow Archangel but it kind of shows up in kind of similar areas. So I would say it's, and it doesn't grow up trees like ivy does. It's gonna be a more localized problem. Um, that said, if it's growing in the forest in an area that nobody planted it, by all means, yeah, dig it up. And I believe it, the one that I have seen in the woods a few times is the Vinca Major. Oh, okay. Because the Vinca Minor has a slightly more, and one of the sites was an old homestead, like you mentioned, up in Whatcom. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then oh, I saw it last year on Fashion somewhere. I can't remember now mm. exactly where it was. Interesting. Oh, in my mother's backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not that hard to, to control. Uh, it's just it's just a little bit tough. I mean, it's a woody, a woody you know, ground cover. So, but yeah, good to keep an eye on it. Okay, so there's a question about balancing wanting to uh, compost things uh, versus uh, you know putting them in a landfill and you know the benefits of of composting uh, versus going to a landfill and uh, I I would say that I think the level of material that you'd be putting into a landfill is is not going to make a a huge difference uh, one way or another and you know whether it's uh, in a landfill or it just decomposes it's still going to be releasing uh, carbon emissions uh, but think you know you can think about it this way is that each of those things like scotch broom plants and so forth are preventing trees from growing and are preventing those trees from doing their uh, magical wonderful carbon sequestration activity uh, so I think the, uh, the, the the balance is would be in favor of of getting rid of the invasives, and you know it's kind of the same with you know using chemicals in some situations. You know which is the greater environmental ill, introducing a chemical into the environment, or letting the invasive species uh, take over and create a a widespread monoculture. Um, you know ultimately I think it's going to be a matter of of opinion, this is where we get uh, away maybe from from actual science to uh, to personal value or societal values. Uh, that's my take. Uh, we have a question about a community garden near a railroad track with tons of scotch broom between the garden and the tracks. Uh, can we do anything about the weeds, or is that a county matter? That's not even going to be a county Railway. matter. It's going to be a BNSF matter. Yeah. yeah. And they are very picky about who goes near their railroad tracks. Yes. And we're assuming this is an active rail line as opposed to right one yes. of the defunct rail right. lines that's now a trail or something like that. Yeah, there are very few counties that control Scotch Broom countywide. It's not usually regulated in Western Washington. Um, so I mentioned Kintas County might be the exception. So generally it's up to whoever is managing that land if they're going to want to control it. The NSF uh, probably don't care, probably wouldn't care. <laughs> uh, but if it's a city or a county owned trail um, or state owned, it, they might care enough to, to do something about it. Yeah. So, but, but they uh, will likely in, care about you going to work on their property. Yeah, nobody wants you to, to go on the property without you asking for permission, um, both for safety, liability. They might plans to do something. Um, but what I was going to say is if you're in, um, if you're, if you have a question about who should be taking care of weeds in a particular spot, that's what the county weed board is really good at figuring out. So, um, they won't necessarily have the ability to, to, to get rid of that scotch room, but they might be able to figure out who would own that land or who would manage that land that you could contact. Um, so we definitely, in King County, definitely encourage contacting us and we can usually track down um, the agency, public agency, or, or landowner that you could contact. Okay. Oh, and from Bank Miller, you've got a, a kudos for the King County Noxious Weeds website as a great resource, and, and I totally agree. I think it's probably the, <laughs> the, the, best, the best county site in the state for Noxious Weeds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm really liking the state weed board now, though, so, and some of the other counties are really great, too. So. <laughs> I think think we have exhausted all the questions, but there are quite a few. We may have missed something. So if we missed you, type fast or, you know, you can just type wait a sec in the chat box and hit enter so we know that you're typing something and we don't uh, close it out here too early. Um, but otherwise, I think we have come to the end of the line here. Thank you very much, Sasha. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you. It was good. Thanks for handling the questions. As soon as I stop sharing, I get to see the chat window. It looks really active. <laughs> it was. It was very active this evening. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, everybody who is still here listening. Um, it's been a pleasure.
All right. Well, um, yes, my thanks to everyone, to Sasha and all of you listening out there. Uh, so nice to spend an evening with you. And uh, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and close us out and wish everyone a very pleasant evening.